If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to look at Mark. We'll be in Mark chapter 9, and we'll be looking at Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 41. And John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Amen. Pray with me. Our Father and our God, we turn again our hearts to your word. And Father, like salvation, like uh, so many things in the Christian life that we, we need you. We need the powerful working of your spirit to breathe life into our bones. We need the powerful working of your spirit to bring about understanding. And not just understanding of your word. Um, but also obedience to your word. And so, Father, I pray that you would do just that this morning, that you will open our our eyes, that we will behold the wonderful things from your law. And I pray that you would be pleased to speak through your servant to do that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So would you agree with me that, uh, that discernment is a mark of a maturing Christian? If you think about what Paul writes, let's say in Romans chapter 12, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern, that word discern, what is the will of God. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. She's there again. Or what about later in in 1 Corinthians where Paul says, if anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body and, and the blood of Christ, you drink judgment upon yourself. Or what about Ephesians chapter 5 where Paul says, walk as children of the light that your love, uh, walk as children of the light discerning what pleases the Lord? Or what about his prayer in Philippians chapter 1? It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and pure, that you might be blameless for the day of Christ. In other words, in Paul's mind, discernment is the mark of a maturing believer, discerning between truth and error. Discerning the body and blood of Christ is not just mere physical food, but this is a sacrament given to the church for the strengthening of our faith. Discerning between truth and what is heretical. Discerning between what is the will of God and what are my own sinful impositions and desires that a mark for Paul is learning and being given discernment. Would you agree then that there are times to confront, to be courageous, to exclude, to be bold, to be firm, and to be protective? Of course so. The disciples had to. Jesus told them the things that you will preach and the letters that you will write, it will land you in prison. And you will be crucified because you will not tolerate, right, heresy. And you will be uh, mocked and scoffed. And you will be killed and persecuted for my sake. Right? So there is a time to be courageous and to be bold. But it's also a time to be humble. And rather to rebuke, to embrace Now think about the Apostle Paul, who is Johnny come lately to the Apostles. Imagine what's going through their minds when this man who used to persecute the church 
shows up and says, one, that he saw Jesus. And two, that the Gentiles are coming into faith on account of his labors. The disciples have a decision to make. Do we rebuke him and put him in place and say, no, brother, you are not within the fellowship? Or do we extend to him the right hand of fellowship? Do we examine the grace of God that's at work in his life and his ministry and give him our blessing? Discernment, right? Is he a sheep in wolf's clothing? Or is he truly one of us? They had to learn. Are you encountering competition? Or are you encountering a co-laborer? Does this person need to be rebuked? Or do they need to be received? Is this person a fraud and an imposter, or are they friends of the gospel? That's what's going on in our passage. Jesus is about to go to a cross. We're in Matthew, I mean, we're in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 10, and if you get to Mark chapter 11, you may not realize it, but Mark slows down the rest of his gospel that everything that happens in Mark chapter 11 to the end all happens in a week. And so what we're getting in Mark 8 and 9 and 10, these are kind of the final words of discipleship to the disciples. And here's the thing that Jesus is laying to bear upon them. If you're going to follow me, when I go to be at the right hand of the Father, you have to learn to discern. Who's a co-laborer of the cross and who's a competitor to it? Who's a fraud and who's a friend? And that's true for us. That the more we grow in Jesus, the more we need that ability strengthened and developed. Because here's the danger. If you lack discernment, and you yoke yourself with anything and anyone and any teaching, you might find yourself on the opposing end of the gospel. And the opposite is true. If your circle is too small, you might find yourself opposing the work of the Spirit in the lives and hearts of brothers and sisters. And so we need discernment just like they did. And so the first thing I want us to think about in our passage is we need proper discernment because of this war that we're in. Now, when I was growing up, um, I played soccer. I went to Davis Magnet School, which is now the Barack Obama School, which is on Congress Street. And it was a weird school, right? It was weird because, one, we had soccer fields outside. And you got to know, like, people of color, when I was growing up, we didn't play soccer, right? And so we would go to recess, and I kind of grew up thinking it was just kind of normal for people to look like me who played soccer year-round. Little did I know that my professor, a professor at Jackson State, who was one of my best friend's father, who was from the Caribbean islands, he played soccer. He grew up playing soccer. And his dream was to bring soccer to Jackson and to put it in JPS. And so our school was a little guinea pig. And so we would often practice around the city. We would normally practice at Murrah. But for a couple of weeks, we, Murrah fo- fo- football team needed the field. And so we had to practice in Georgetown, which is over by Lanier. And so we went and we set up our cones and we had practice. And all of a sudden, like we had been playing together for three to five years. And all of a sudden, these uh, four or five kids from that neighborhood decided they they saw us playing and they wanted, I'm going to go play soccer. And so they kind of walk up and our coach is like, yeah, come on. And here's the thing about soccer. I mean, you can be athletic, you can be fast, you can be all of that. But soccer is not like baseball or basketball or football. You can't use these. You get a penalty for using these. 
It's all about these down here. All the entire game, except your th- except a throw-in or a goalie. Everybody else, if you touch your the ball with your hand, it's a penalty. And so these kids get on the field, and they're athletes, right? They can flat out run, but the problem was they've never picked, well, never kicked a soccer ball. And so you know how this goes. We're like nine and ten, and we've been playing soccer every bit of three to five years, and they had never touched the ball. And you can imagine what that looks like when they were playing with us. And you can imagine how cocky some of our teammates began to be, right? Kind of doing little numbers and, and kicking the ball over their heads. And, and the guys were, I mean, they were, I mean, just making fun of them. And then practice ended. And me and a friend of mine, the one who was talking all the noise, we were kind of on equipment duty. So we had to go and get all the balls and get all the cones. And so meanwhile, our coach is like way over there. And the entire team is like way over there. And the four guys are kind of like right here, kind of huddling and talking. And they're not smiling no more, right? And I saw it. I'm like right here looking. And I'm looking at the coach like way over there. I'm looking at the dude that was talking noise right here. And I'm looking at the four players from Georgetown who never played soccer, who you just joked. And all of a sudden, you're by yourself. And I saw it. I I saw it about to happen. I'm like, oh, they finna jump him, right? (laughs) And so he's walking, trying to pick up his cleats and thinking that everything is cool. And one guy kind of trips him up and and the four kids kind of jump on him. And and all of a sudden, I scream for the coach and the uh, the other teammates, we all kind of run back and the guys get up and run. He said, I bet you won't laugh now, right? And just kind of ran off. But I could see it happening. Even as a kid, God in his common grace, just something didn't seem right. Something just didn't feel right. Something didn't look right. And it didn't take an adult to see it. Call it intuition, call it discernment, call it awareness. But that's one of God's kind of common grace gifts to us. And I think that's what's going on in the passage. Jesus and his, Jesus' disciples are walking And they see something, something over here that's kind of going on. This no-name dude who's saying some stuff and doing some stuff, and they see demons kind of coming out, and and their radar is going off. They're like, wait, 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 something ain't right here. Now, why isn't it right? Because that man was a no-name man. He didn't know them. They didn't know him, et cetera. But their radars went off because they saw something that was not normal. Now, before we kind of ride them, can you just kind of think about what they had witnessed in their lives with Jesus? On the one hand, they witnessed Jesus casting out demons and doing miracles. But they also witnessed the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and and the scribes who saw Jesus doing these things, and you would think that the religious leaders of the day would kind of be lining up with Jesus. And that's not what they did. What did they accuse Jesus of? You're a fraud. You're a phony. You're doing everything you're doing by the power of Satan. Now, if I'm a disciple. I'm looking at the religious leaders. I'm looking at this Jesus guy. I'm like totally confused because this guy says he's the Christ, But then he says he's going to die and then be raised up. And these people are supposed to be the religious leaders. But now they're saying this dude is doing all of this stuff by the power of Satan. Do you see the need for discernment? As on some level, they're going to have to discern who is who and what is what and which way is up. Which makes perfect sense, right? John, the same John who we hear about in this passage And think about it, right? We only need discernment because the world we live in is broken. Because of sin, because of deception, because of the the evil one who parades around like um, an angel of light. Because there's this war between the kingdom of Satan and there's an active presence of God who shows it through the person and work of Jesus, you get this war happening. And because of this war, we need discernment. 
which is why John, the same John who wrote this, who's talked about in this passage, he wrote Revelation, he wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He says, many antichrists have gone out from us, and they were never really with us, or they would have remained. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. I write these things so that you will not be deceived by them. Or for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Christ in the flesh, such one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourself. So on one hand, John himself is saying a posture of a believer is that who practices discernment. Is this true? And is this opposed to the gospel? And then on the other side of the equation, you have Jesus in our passage. Did you see what Jesus says in verse 40? For the one who is not against us is for us. Wait a minute. Make your mind up, right? Do I need to watch out for everybody? Or over here, do I need to have a, an open invitation to anybody? Here's the danger. If you think Christianity, kind of kumbayas with everybody who believes anything, and you extend to them the right hand of fellowship, you're in trouble because you're undermining the work of the enemy. On the other hand, right? If you oppose any and everybody because you're scared, guess what, you, guess what you're undermining? The unity of the body of Christ. You get it? It's a slippery slope. What's needed, believers, is discernment. Courage to confront heresy and humility to embrace those who are on our team. We need it. Now, the second thing we see in our passage is left to ourselves we lack it. Left to ourselves, we lack it because of the war going on inside of us. We quickly learn that what they did in this particular moment was sinful. Now, why? Because they tried to rebuke the guy, to stop the guy. And then Jesus says in verse 39, he says, but don't stop him. Now, in the Greek, this is in the imperative, which means that this is not a suggestion. This is Jesus telling the disciples, you better not try to stop this man from doing what he's doing. So think about it. In a place where they're supposed to be welcoming, what are they doing? They're trying to stop this man. Now, the question is, on what grounds? And, and they say it in verse 38, because he was not following us. That's what's kind of sad, y'all. This man might have been a stranger to them, but he wasn't a stranger to God. And because this man was not in the 12, because they didn't know his faith, they didn't know his credentials. They didn't know his name. They didn't know where he came from. They passed judgment on this man and said, because you're not over here in our tribe, then guess what? You need to shut it down. And Jesus says, no, I rebuke you for that. Now, see, I think, I think there are hints here in the passage not just that Jesus rebukes them, that's evident. But, but why should this brother have been viewed as a brother? I think one reason he should be viewed as a brother is the fruit of his work. Whoever this man is, he's fruitful. Mark tells us they saw him casting out demons. So underline the S. This ain't just one demon. This is like demons as in the plural. And he was not trying to do it. 
Look at the Greek. I mean, look at the, look at the Bible. It says they were trying to stop him. This man wasn't trying to cast out no demons. He was casting out the demons. They were the ones trying to stop him. But this man was not trying to do this. He had success in doing it. Now, you see in the book of Acts, this kind of thing comes up again. In Acts 19, the sons of Sceva, they saw Paul healing and casting out demons. And then they saw some itinerant Jewish exorcists who tried to invoke the name of Jesus over them. And did you, you remember what the, the, the evil demon said? It, it says, and they said, I adjure you by, by the Jesus Paul proclaims to come out. And the spirit said, the Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And the demon actually jumped out of the, out of the man, and it says he, he beat all of them down. Beat them so bad, beat the brakes off of them, right? They, they end up getting, getting beat out of their clothes. That's not what's happening here. This brother is casting out demons. He's fruitful. But you also see something else. He's faithful. Did you notice that his name is never mentioned in this book? We saw a man. We saw a man. Now, you want to know whose name is mentioned in this section? It's John, the, the brother, the son of thunder. The same John who wrote the Gospel of John. The same John in the Gospel of John who never uses his name. Now, why does he not use his own name in his own gospel? Because he wants us to read his gospel and to draw the conclusion that I'm not that important. What you need to be focusing on is not my name. You need to be focusing on the name of Jesus, right? And so John does that so that when we read his gospel, that our eyes are all on Jesus. And here you see in Mark's gospel, it's flipped. John is the ringleader, and the unnamed man is actually the one who is appealing to a higher name. Did you catch what John says in verse 38? Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons, and it does not say in his own name. It says in your name. And then what did Jesus say in verse 39? He says, but Jesus says, do not stop him for no one who does a mighty work in my name. Right there. That, that's the key. This brother is not just fruitful, but he is also faithful. He goes down in Mark's gospel where we don't know his name, but we do know the name that he worshiped and the name by which he casted out the demons. And it is the name of Jesus. And so they're supposed to see both the fruit and the faithfulness of this brother, and they're supposed to draw the conclusion he is not a competitor. He's a co-laborer. Why then do they rebuke him? Why is their judgment impaired? Put your finger on Mark 9, 17. Y'all remember where we've been since we've been in Mark 9? This might refresh your memory. And someone from the crowd answered Jesus, teacher, which is the same word that John uses in verse 38, teacher. Some man comes to Jesus and calls him teacher. I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and it becomes rigid. And so I ask your disciples, and this is nine of them. Jesus has been on the mountain with three of them. He comes down and there's this man who has this son who's possessed by one demon. And this man brings his son possessed by one demon to the nine disciples for them to cast the demon out. And notice what the man said. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able to do it. And Jesus answered them, you faithless generation. And then at the bottom of, of, of look at it right down to verse 28. And when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. 
Now, follow the logic here. One man, one son, one demon, nine disciples whom Jesus calls faithless, which at the bottom of it, he, he says it's basically prayerlessness and layer that on top of what they were arguing about last week. Look at it right before our passage. And they came to Capernaum, look at verse 33. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent for on the way he, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And in marking humor, like it's kind of funny. What none of y'all couldn't do for one. This one man over here is casting out many demons. While you're over here arguing about being great. This man out here getting it in. Or you're over here chasing the greatness of the world. This no-named, unnamed, faithful brother is out here working. And you have the audacity to come and rebuke him. I rebuke you for your pride and for your wanting to be great. That is why their ability to discern is impaired. Because they are intoxicated with the greatness of the world. They want to be great. They want their names in the lights. They're jockeying for position and for status, all while this no-name man not in their tribe is getting it. Even more, did you notice what Jesus says after he says that? He says, do you not know that whoever even gives you but a cup of water to drink because you belong to me, will by no means lose his reward. You're chasing greatness, and therefore you're hating on this dude who should be a brother, and in your pursuit of greatness, you're missing that I'm the God of small things. You don't need to cast out a bunch of demons. Small things such as giving, giving Christians glasses of water who's being persecuted that's great in my kingdom. But because you're chasing greatness of the world, you can't stand to see him doing something you can't do. And you're missing that I'm the God of small things. Look, there are questions. How did this guy get power? How did he know Jesus? I don't know. And I don't think Mark wants us to try to figure that out. Doesn't this sound a lot like Numbers 11? When Moses is on the mountain and the spirit of God is poured out and some of it goes to the elders. And then there's these other two dudes that Wright talked about. And all of a sudden, these dudes ain't been in the tent. They haven't been near the Lord, but somehow the spirit is on them and they're prophesying. And, it, and, and two people. First, this little kid's like, hey, something's wrong with this guy. They should not be doing this. And they go get, get Joshua, and Joshua goes to Moses, shut him down, shut him down. And what did Moses say? Are you jealous for me? Would that all of God's people be prophets? It's the same thing going on in our passage. We don't know how Buddy got power. We don't know how he knew about Jesus. And that's the point. Your God is so big that he can do things outside of your tribe and he does not need to run them by you for your permission. That's the point. And you know what? We're unable to judge rightly. We're prone to believe lies and we're prone to compete with people on our team. And you know why? Because of our pride and our brokenness. And we want to be great. And I'm guilty of it. One of the best things to happen to me, to slap me in my face, to show me this, was at Jackson State. I was there as one of five or six 
other campus ministers. So you got me, I'm Presbyterian through and through, right? Reform, went to RTS, right? You got my brother Smiley, who's with InterVarsity. Then you got another lady, she's with the Wesley Foundation. She's the Methodist pastor on campus. Then you got uh, somebody from the Word of Faith Church. They're starting revolution on campus, right? And here, here was my posture. Man, they so wrong. All of them wrong. All of them heretics, right? And it was so wrong. I was after the greatness of the world. Let me build my group. My group is going to be good. My group is going to have solid theology. And I discounted the spirit of God at work through brothers and sisters who were not in my tribe. And it was wrong. And it took our vice president. This is, this is when the nail was in the coffin. He says, can you give me the stats for religious involvement? I'm like, oh, yeah. We got 250 coming, a large group, and we got, and I sent it to him. I don't just want your stats. I want you to go talk to everybody else, and I need to present everything to the president. And furthermore, next year, we're going to do Religious Emphasis Week, and all of y'all are going to get along for a week. <laughs> and all of y'all are going to have a day, and you're going to support each other's events. And I'm dreading it. Like, man, I, I don't want to go do none of this. It was the best thing that happened to me. To go be with brothers and sisters who might not agree. But, man, God was at work. He was at work, and I was wrong. Just this week, we had to have some work done on our house. I had some mold kind of coming out one of our HVAC units, uh, just the heat, man, and brought a team in to come and uh, clean out our duct work. And, and it happens all the time. Like, I just hang around. I fixed the, the brother some coffee and just sat and talked with him. And then that question came, so what you do for a living? <laughs> I'm like, I pastor. I pastor a church. You do that full time? I'm like, yep. Yep, that's why I'm, I'm able to be here, and I'm going to get into the office right after this and work a little late today. Okay. You know what the second question to me was? What denomination is your church? And you know why that hurt me? Because that's what the culture thinks about the church. Before they think about the Jesus we love, they think about the tribes we're aligned to. And so it's no longer a question of tell me about your Jesus or tell me about what you think the Bible says about this. The first question the culture is now asking us is what kind of church is it? And you know why that's wrong? Because we're more famous for what divides us than what unites us. We so pound the gong of being reformed or being Presbyterian or being Baptist or being non-denominational or being Pentecostal that, that that is what the world out there starts to think about the church. It's not our common unity. It's not the unity that Jesus prayed when he prayed in his high priestly prayer. Lord, let the world see your love for me and for them through the unity of the church. He was not just praying for the PCA in John 17. He was praying for his global, historic, timeless, big, beautiful, diverse church of people who bow the knee to Jesus. And maybe you've done that. Maybe you look down on authors 
who don't come out of our tradition. Or maybe this idea of greatness has so enamored you that you can't appreciate the small things that Jesus says, I see. I see you bringing her to church in a wheelchair. And of course, you're not up front preaching, but make no mistake about it. If you just serve a cup of water, your Father in heaven sees it. How many times have you been guilty of discounting the God of small things because we're intoxicated with greatness? So here's the question. How are we delivered so that we can view co-laborers as co-laborers and not competitors? First, it takes passages like this. You read 1 John, you read 2 John, be on guard. That is true, yes and amen. And you read passages like ours. If they're not against us, they're for us. Don't listen to them in mono. Listen to it in stereo. And what Jesus is doing through our passage today, if you lean toward skepticism and pride and, and, and making much of your tribe, Jesus says, come on, brother or sister, I'm going to pull you back on this side where you can appreciate the beautiful global diversity of God's true church. Passages like this one, they correct that in us. Second, I think we see in our passage the seed of what later becomes this tree of first things. Now, what do I mean by seed that becomes a tree? It's normal in the Bible to have seed form, right? Something that's planted, and later in the Bible, it blossoms into something more robust and huge and more defined. Think about this with an altar. When Abraham worships on an altar, this place to meet a living God, this place to offer a sacrifice, then it kind of becomes this tabernacle, right? This portable place. And then it becomes this temple, right? This fixed place. And then it becomes Jesus who tabernacled amongst us, who is where and how we meet with the one true God. But the seed was planted all the way back there in Genesis, getting us ready for this big tree later. Here's what I think is happening in our passage. We see a few things in this man. First, he's faithful. There's fruit. He's appealing to the name of Jesus and not his own. And for that reason, in that passage, Jesus is telling the disciples, no matter how they came to me, you don't have to have it all figured out. What we can agree on are the essentials. This brother is fruitful and this brother is doing this by my name through my power. Now, we later get what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. He says, I delivered to you that which was of first importance, that Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, and he was buried, and the third day he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. John would later write, by this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. In other words, what both Paul and John, and John are doing is, look, it's not just kumbaya with everybody. No. You got to have essentials. You believe that Jesus is the son of God? I believe that. You believe that you're a sinner destined for hell and God can't. And, and, and the only way that you will be saved from your sins is through the person and work of Jesus. Oh, I believe that. Right. You believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, that it's God breathed, that it's true, all of it. Oh, I believe that you believe that you can't be saved by works of the law, but by faith alone in Christ alone, by God's grace alone. I believe that. Now, here's what happens. This becomes the essentials of our faith. We believe these things, and guess what? 
I don't care if you're Methodist or Pentecostal or non-denominational. If we have agreement on the essential and primary things of the faith, then guess what? We're commanded to have unity around those things. I think this passage is starting to, it's the seed form of what would come later. Third thing, is this not, is our salvation not the epitome of teamwork? If I were to ask you, who saved you? If you were to say, oh, God the Father. You're right, but you're also wrong. Well, Jesus saved me. You're right, but you're also wrong. The Holy Spirit saved me. You're right, and you're also wrong. Don't we believe what Paul writes in Ephesians 1? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose you in Jesus before the foundation of the world. Who did the choosing? The Father. But the Father did not get on a cross for you. That was the second person of the Trinity. That was the Son. You've been redeemed by His blood. He was the one who came to earth and lived the life that you can't live and paid the price that you could pay in hell forever. But He said, I will pay it in hours on a cross. You're washed and you're cleansed not by the blood of the Father, but by the blood of the Son. And who is it that seals you until the day of Christ Jesus? Who is your, the down payment of the inheritance of all things to come? It's the Holy Spirit. And so you might say that our salvation is the epitome of collaboration and cooperation between our triune God where the second person of the Trinity, who is God, agrees to come to earth and to rescue you, but they're all working in collaboration. Now, do you think your salvation happened through the work of a collaboration between Father, Son, and Spirit, and then you're supposed to go out here and do solo dolo work? It's just you, right? You were saved through cooperation. You were saved through teamwork. You were saved through our triune God working together. And we image God, beloved, but we appreciate that. When we recognize that our God is so big that he works through other denominations and other ministries and other churches and other people to the praise of his own glory. And is this not the fruit of of the work of Jesus. You do know that there is a delocalization of ministry in the New Testament. It goes with the 12, but what does Jesus say? I'm going to send you out and I'm going to pour my spirit not just on the 12, but on all flesh. Anyone who believes in me, they will be indwelled by my spirit. They will be priests of the most high God. And so we should anticipate that God is going to do work through other people, not in our circles. To the praise and fame of his name. Now, why does this matter? I'm going to land the plane right here. Why is this important? First, some of you are going to leave. It's one of the bittersweet things about being a redeemer. 
And some of you are going to go to other cities. And there's going to be a little whisper in your ear. I can't find no church. They're not preaching the gospel. There's no good churches here. No, that, that can't be true. It may mean you have to step out of your comfort zone. But if we believe in a big God who is at work in our world, there are good churches out there. And maybe you're here this morning, and you're not Presbyterian. And we sing some songs that you don't know, and we don't do some stuff you wish we do. Right? Right? And you're like, man, I don't know. I'm kind of close, but man, I don't know now. I don't know, pastor, right? <laughs> We're on the same team. We love Jesus here. And we believe in his word here. And we believe in the work of his spirit right here. And if you're looking for a church home, we on the same team. We on the same team. And maybe you're a campus minister and you're working on a campus and your ministry is kind of small and somebody else's ministry is booming and that longing for human greatness kind of rises up. Can we read this passage and pray for that ministry? Some of what our world needs is collaboration between the saints. I'll close with this. R.C. Sproul has become one of, and and he's dead now. He died in December of 2017. But he's become one of my favorite men to read. And not just since he died, but I'm just reading more of him lately. In his commentary on Mark, listen to how he balances this. There are many people who do not worship the way that we do, who do not share the same confession of faith that we have, who interpret biblical passages very differently, yet they are ministering in the name of Jesus. We must appreciate and embrace authentic ministry wherever we find it. We have to distance ourselves from heresy when we find it. Simply put, we need discernment. And then, in Scott Sauls' book, Jesus outside the lines. You know, you, you know what he said? He said, R.C. Sproul was lecturing in Nashville. And he was lecturing on reform theology. And his theological framework was noticeably different from Billy Graham. And somebody in the audience asked R.C. Sproul, Do you think we will see Billy Graham in heaven? And R.C. Sproul got quiet. And he says, no. I don't think I'll see Billy Graham in heaven. And he started to weep. He says, Billy Graham will be so close to the throne of Jesus that I will only see his back. That's the kind of Christian that I want to be. That's the kind of Christian that I want us to be. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless you. We love you. We're about to sing the church is one foundation, and it's not our denomination. It's not our theology. The church is one foundation. It's a beautiful lovely person of Jesus. Father, I pray that we will sing this song in faith and that you will conform our hearts around the truths thereof. Amen.